Hello, I'm Brett Moss, and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Our guest today is Dr. Antonio Betancourt. Dr. Betancourt is Director of the Office of Governmental Relations of the Universal Peace Federation in Washington, D.C. He's also the Executive Director of both the Summit Council for World Peace and the Association for the Unity of Latin America. He's President of the World Institute for Development and Peace, which is dedicated to advancing economic justice through the democratization of money and capital. He's also a frequent contributor on CNN International in Spanish. He's married to Kyoko Funayama, and together they have four children. In July of next year, he and his wife will celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. Dr. Antonio Betancourt, welcome to The Defining Moment. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here today. Well, I'm very happy to be here in Santa Monica, California. I'll bring greetings from the East Coast, from Washington. Appreciate you being here. It's really Thank great to have you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Our topic today is the democratization of access to money and credit. Dr. Betancourt, was there a defining moment which led you to become active in the area of economics and particularly working in the advancement of the investigation of leading edge research into economic justice and democratization? Yes. You know, for the last 33 years, I dedicated my life to create a better world, to use whatever resources I have, both intellectual, external, whatever gifts I have to leave a legacy that my children, grandchildren uh, can enjoy. In 1991, upon the collapse, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, I was absolutely flabbergasted that intellectuals in the West, particularly here in the United States, dare to say that we won, we won, that our system was superior to communism and therefore the victory has been won. What they meant to say for me was that the grievances that gave birth to international socialism and the Soviet experiment since the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 has been resolved. Since I come from Latin America and uh, Colombia in particular, and I have seen the ugliness of poverty at the worst, and I have seen the gap between the very rich and the very poor all over the world, because I have traveled, in, until 1991, I have traveled probably around 120 countries all over the world. So I realized how far-fetched that kind of statement was. So I felt that we had to look for advanced ideas that will help us to address seriously the issues of lack of participation, disenfranchisement, and abject poverty around the world. And that was my beginning of getting involved in addressing this issue of economic justice. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Why has the concentration of wealth become such a complex societal problem? in both rich and poor countries all over the world? The problem is that we, our economies, whether you talk about the command economy of the socialist model or the capitalist economy of the market economy, the Wall Street model, these two systems, in, not only in my opinion, but in the opinion of many people who follow the model that we are proposing, these two systems are exhausted. They, whatever was good and whatever was bad has been done already. These two systems are not equipped to address the issues of the masses of the world. In other words, socialism creates a monopoly of the state or a bureaucracy of government. Mm -hmm. Capitalism as we know it creates a monopoly 
of the private sector, mm -hmm. of people that are either very clever, very capable, or have a lot of inheritance, yes. a lot of capital to move. Yes. So this inherent potential for monopoly cannot resolve the situation of hundreds of millions of people who are emerging from all over the world ready to participate in the global economy. Mm. What we are proposing is the creation of a market economy for the masses. Mm. The market economy as it is right now is not for the masses. Okay. The masses, the best they can expect out of the market economy or out of the, of the Wall Street model is a wage for hire. They'll sell their labor. Okay. But that doesn't mean that they are participating actively in the economy of the world. As entrepreneurs do, for example. No. They have to be owners. Mm -hmm. The system as it is, both socialistic and capitalistic, do not create new owners. Do not spread wealth fast enough for the needs of the 21st century. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Is it really possible, in your view, to broaden the base of ownership where great economic disparity continues to persist? Yes. To do that, we have to follow certain models that have been created, particularly here in the United States. In the U.S., in the 1970s, culminating in 1979, 21 laws were approved by the U.S. Congress that allowed 3 million ordinary Americans, people with no previous accumulations, no previous savings, no capital, allowed them to acquire more than $100 billion worth of, of, of uh, corporate equity hmm. with an added value of more than $400 billion. Hmm. This is a fact. Wow. 3 million ordinary Americans. Hmm. That model was based on new financial instruments and new legal or legislative laws of instruments, tools that en en enable people to exchange labor for credit, future labor for credit. And that model exists and should be uh, available from the U.S to the world. The 2006 winner of the Nobel Peace Prize from Bangladesh, Muhammad Yunus, who is also the founder of the concept of microcredit and the founder of Grameen Bank, was recognized for his efforts in creating economic and social development from below. How do Yunus's ideas differ from Luis Kelso's third way economic vision for the 21st century? I am glad you mentioned, you mentioned Luis Kelso, because Luis Kelso was a revolutionary thinker mm. in the 1950s, uh, 60s, and 70s, who created the ESOPs, the Employee Stock Ownership Plans, that allowed uh, ordinary citizens, workers, and employee, employees to acquire the corporation by the manipulation of credit and the liquidation of credit through the economic activity of the corporations they bought. One uh, example of that, for example, uh, was uh, Avis uh, rental car. Mm. The workers and, and employees of that enterprise bought the corporation for $1.7 billion. Mm. And they paid, I believe, within three years. And they used the corporation itself as a guarantor, mm -hmm. and the commercial banks, based on the ideas and the laws that were, uh, that were passed by Congress, they were able to do that. And there were many other, 10,000 corporations in America are owned by workers. Now, how the experience of the Grammy Bank of Bangladesh differs from this? Well, the Bangladesh experience has been 
extremely beneficial for humanity because it has addressed the issue of extreme abject poverty in communities all over the world, particularly for women, where $10 loan, $100 loan, $200, $500 loan will make a big difference in, the, in, in, in families and in communities all over the world. However, what we're talking about is not micro credit, it's macro credit. It's to allow people to participate in the, in the ownership of the technologies that are coming, that are displacing workers. Allowed people to participate as owners of the new infrastructure that needs to be created. They allowed workers to participate of innovation, allowed people in, in a village to participate as owners of the tunnel that will reduce five hours traveling to one hour. Mm. The building of highways and harbors and ports and all the things that needs to be done in economic uh, community, economic development and so forth that allow ordinary citizens to borrow money from commercial banks hmm. and pay with the economic activity of those corporations. Hmm. That is a, is a big difference, is, is, is to transform communities with billions and billions of dollars available in countries around the world to, be, uh, to make them available for loans for the common citizen, for the masses. In other words, to make the uh, market economy available to the masses, not just to the 5%, or 1%, or 3%, or 30% of the population who control the capital. Now, don't the, um, the people that move capital in America and around the world, don't they understand the value of creating uh, of, of distributing wealth more widely among uh, the masses in order to create, in a sense, more potential consumers for their, for their goods and services? Isn't that a win-win situation? Theoretically, yes. And in reality, it, it is being done, but not at the speed that is required. And part of, part of it is the limitations of the system of lending that we inherited from the 19th century or 18th century which means that you have to risk your own capital in order to create growth, in order to uh, create investments. You have countries, for example, uh, I remember one country in Latin America uh, 10 years ago. The Inter-American Development Bank had allocated $60 million for uh, private sector development. And it was already a year, and out of the $60 million, only about $5 million had been used by the private sector. Hmm. The, the other $55 million have to return to the, to, the, to the bank, international bank. Why? Because the growth of the country the, uh, did not secure the repayment of the loans, you know, it was the creation of new industries, according to the Wall Street model. However, if they have used the model that we're talking about, that will be a big difference. Because instead of having one person having to risk his capital for the creation of new enterprises, the enterprises will be created by common citizens using insurance and reinsurance plus whatever they invested the capital in as a guarantee. This model has worked in the United States effectively and it has worked in the countries where it has been implemented. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. What is economic democracy and what does it have in common with political democracy? In your opinion, why should credit be a basic human right? Well, the thing is, you either own or be owned. Mm. In other words, either you are an owner uh -huh. of assets, yes. real assets, or somebody will own you. Mm. 
in, in political democracy, you have one person, one vote. Yes. And you have the right to that vote because mm -hmm. it's through that vote that you participate in the creation of the nation, yes. in, the, in, 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 in the creation, you, you participate in the affairs mm -hmm. of the nation yes. as a citizen, as an individual. Right. However, when you have political democracy parallel with economic plutocracy, mm. then democracy, political democracy doesn't work because for political democracy to work, you need effectively one person, one vote, mm -hmm. one person, one owner. Mm. In fact, if you look at the development of democracy in the United States in the, in the initial stages, democracy was avail available only to the owners of property. Hmm. Because why do you need a, a political democracy? To, to protect. You have to participate in the creation and enactment and reinforcing of laws to protect something that you considered dear. Uh -huh. And that visibly, practically, is property. Mm. You don't create democracy to protect ideas and to protect ideals unless those ideas and ideals are represented in, conc in, in concrete things, hmm. such as property. Property uh, precedes true political democracy. So we propose political democracy with economic democracy. One person, one vote, one person, one owner. The individuals have the right to credit, to have credit. Why? Because I have the potential to create wealth. And because I have the potential to create wealth, I have the potential to liquidate credit. The system is available to make this, uh, 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 to create uh, uh, a true democratization of access to money and credit for the masses. What we lack is the political will to do it. And, and for that, we unfortunately don't have the time to deal with, with, with all the, the intricacies, so why not? Well, can you give us a, just a brief overview or, or touch on some important aspects to how, how uh, uh, people can go about generating, how societies can go about generating that political will? Well, first, people have to be educated in what is, what is the culture of ownership. Uh, most people or many people uh, cannot go beyond themselves as wage earners, selling their, 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 their wages. It's an, almost an evolutionary step, right? Exactly. So we need the government, the private sector, the intergovernmental and, and uh, non-governmental organizations have to get involved in educating the people towards ownership. But the government is the one who has to create the conditions for people to thrive for people to have equality of opportunities. Not just as it is today, where opportunities only exist for the ones who have already accumulations of money. And what would be the incentive of governments to do that? To eradicate poverty, uh -huh. to increase the, the economic pie of the nation. You will have, you know, automatically millions of people with access to purchase in power. So it's a way to multiply wealth in it's the It's the nation. way to multiply wealth. It's the way to multiply the owners of the economy. So it should be a very attractive uh, concept to any government that, that's interested in, in, uh, in multiplying its own wealth. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. So in a sense, the, the, the merit of the idea itself can help to generate that political will. Yes. However, there are there are a lot of misconceptions about, about uh, economic empowerment through the democratization of access to money and credit. And these misconceptions come from the scholars that adhere themselves to Keynesian, to Freeman, to uh, uh, other 
uh, masters of economics that come from the 19th century and the early 20th century, and they're stuck with this with these ideas. They, they they're not willing to consider new ones. So eventually, the masses have to demand this. This has to be done not because of uh, of some moral, which is which there is there, but it it is. It has to be done because it's the right thing to do for countries. So you're referring to a grassroots type of movement. And the, and the response of the governments towards uh, the needs of the masses. Uh -huh. That's right. We cannot allow, for example, in the case of Colombia, and I can give you many, sure. mention many countries, where the biggest competitor to the formal economy is the criminal economy mm. of drugs, narco-traffickers, mm -hmm. guerrillas. Right you find that a lot of the insurgents around the world who are fighting government, who are fighting the private sector, who are fighting the corporations, fighting the, the, in, the industrial sector, are doing it for hire because there's nothing else to do. Yes. There's nothing else to do. The economy as it is right now in many countries of the world is closed. It does not allow for new owners, for new, new, new en entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. There is a, the idea that the present owners have to own whatever goes in and goes out in a country. Mm. And innovation, they also have to own it. If it's a new technology that is coming into the nation, they have to be the owners. Mm -hmm. So that particular idea does not create new owners. Mm. And it creates a dependency. And it creates a gap between haves and have-nots with an incredible resentment on the part of those who are not participating and those who are controlling the, the opportunities in the nation or in the country. The process of globalization, for example, is creating a major problem for the corporations and for the present system. The corporations as we know them and the present system is creating problems for the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Wherever they meet, you notice that something goes on when, wherever they meet? With protesters. There's protesters and people don't want them and people are throwing rocks at them. Yes. Why is that? Mm. Because they considered part of a system that failed to the masses. Yes. Failed to the masses. Socialism taken from the rich to give to the poor is not the solution. No. Because it denies a basic right of the individual which is to move forward and upward. Mm -hmm. Capitalism fail also because it's predicated upon the foundation of capital on individuals. If you have capital, you can't participate in the economy. The system is designed to give you, according to your credit, credibility, uh, uh, cre uh, your credit worthiness, mm -hmm. to give you consumer credit. Mm. But it's not designed to give you productive credit. Mm. What we're talking about is open the system to productive credit all over the world. Mm. Productive credit does not create inflation mm. because it's not geared towards consumer. Mm. It's geared towards the creation of, of, of uh, uh, factories, uh, production, uh, equipment, development, and so forth. Hmm. Okay, very interesting. Thank you. Now, employee stock ownership plans have lost favor in the United States in recent years. Where did they go wrong? It goes wrong, part of it is because they didn't go far enough. There is no environmental uh, sustain, uh, um, sustainability for many ESOPs. They are fighting forces outside that do not support them. The government basically leave them alone. The government needs to create an environment of education, environment of comfort and support, so not only the present ones will be sustained and will develop and prosper, but new ones will be created at the speed that is needed to make more participants into the national economy and to export these ideas to the rest of the world so, that, so the rest of the world will develop faster than, than they are developing right now. Okay, good, thank you. Now, as a Latin American, what do you believe must take place in the 21st century to bring about a peaceful economic revolution which will turn the tide of the economic injustice and disparity 
which is rampant all over Latin America, for example, as evidenced in the case of countries like Mexico, where maybe 5% of the population controls 80 to 90% of the wealth. And without mention specifically the countries, there are other countries in Latin America in which 1% of the population, in other words, in a population of 11 million, 100,000, 1%, 100,000 owns 90% of the corporate equity of the nation. In, in, in unbelievable in disparities. In many countries in Latin America, and this is all over the world. Mm. So what is the hope? The hope is to change the system. We cannot continue to depend on workers for hire. That creates insecurity because workers for hire cannot compete. The workers for hire of Brazil cannot compete with the workers for hire of Indonesia. The workers for hire in America cannot compete for the workers for hire in China, and so forth and so forth. In addition, there's technologies that are coming that are displacing workers all over the world. There are technologies that are working faster, better, more quality, cheaper than workers. So what is the solution for Latin America and for, 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 for the rest of the world? They have to change the system. They have to consider the democratization of access to money and credit by using central banking, which they already have them and go back to the original intent of the central banks from the, from the, from the 18th and 19th century. Central banks, and, and like, the, like the Federal Reserve, were not meant to be to subsidize, to pay for wars, to pay for dysfunctions, to pay for, for all these things that they pay. They were designed to promote growth. They were designed for economic empowerment. They were designed for uh, production, capital, credit, in other words, to create more capital. They have to go back to the, or, to the original intent in which you discount paper, legitimate paper that can prove to the commercial banks, linked to the central bank, you prove to the commercial bank that the paper you bring it in will liquidate that loan in three, five years, according to Standard & Poor, according to legitimate, well-recognized standards of lending. We're not talking about voodoo economics or reinventing the wheel on lending. We follow strict laws of lending which, which are proven all over the world. What we're talking about is to change the way in which, in which it's done. You can go to the bank and, and, and discount paper, agricultural, industrial, equipment, uh, a structural, whatever trade, paper that you bring in which you prove that you will self-liquidate the loans, whether it is a billion dollars or whether it is a hundred thousand dollars. And that will stimulate the economy, whether it is the global economy, the regional or the national economy, or the local economy in California. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We've already come to the end of our interview, Dr. Betancourt. Thank you so much for being our guest today on The Defining Moment. Really grateful for you sharing those insights with Thank us today. Thank you for inviting me. God bless you. Thank you very much. You. You've been watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. You can find us on the internet at www.definingmoment.tv. Thanks for watching and have a great day.